Hi, everybody. Hola. I've localized for you guys. Did I spell it correctly? Yeah. yeah? Okay, that's great. So that's a good start. So what I'm going to talk to you guys about today is based on uh, 16 years, actually, working as a UX designer in San Francisco, London, and now in Dublin. And 18 months working for these guys, this little company here, Dash.ie. So they're the biggest property portal in Ireland. And by property portal, I mean the type of company, the type of website where you can find an apartment or a house to rent or to buy, that sort of thing. Every country has one or two or three of them. And when I was working in Daft, we were trying to do, implement two processes simultaneously. Uh, we were trying to get the development team to work according to agile software development methods. And as I was the product guy, and I'm a UX guy, we were, I was the product manager, we were also trying to, to do UX. And to make both of those things work together, essentially what we were trying to do was lean UX. And as I was immersing myself in all things lean and lean startup and lean UX and agile, I kind of realized that all those things bore an uncanny resemblance to this Auftrags tactic, our Auftrags tactic. And this was a, a, a German military command philosophy. And, and just like Agile and Lean are different ways of making software, Auftrag tactics was a different way of commanding troops on the battlefield. And it emphasized things like speed and agility and decision making and independent thinking. All the things that we talk about when we talk about Lean and Agile. And this presentation is about what we can learn from the generals that founded or devised this radical approach. But before we get into it, I'm gonna show you a short video from a short clip from a film I'm sure most of you guys have seen before. together was to try and convey the chaos of the battlefield, right? So all of us, we all think we've got stressful jobs. I know I think I've got a stressful job, but nothing compares to that. And it, as it zooms in on Tom Hanks, the actor there, it really emphasizes the fear and the pressure and the strain that those guys were under, right? It's taking everything that he's got just to pull himself together and put on his helmet. Right? And what he doesn't seem like capable of doing at that moment is remembering the specific details of a detailed plan. Now, what was in the plan? What am I supposed to do next? What do the generals back in London want me to do now, now that this has happened? Right? He just doesn't seem capable of remembering all that stuff. Yet that's exactly what traditional armies ask their soldiers to do all the time in situations like that. Is remember lots of details from big, elaborate plans. And 
Asking soldiers to follow a plan under those circumstances was an unnecessary burden that hindered their performance. And in contrast, the German army that they were fighting against over the years had evolved a much more flexible approach. They didn't have to follow a detailed plan. They were just given a mission and they were allowed to use their own initiative and their own decision making to figure out the best way of achieving that mission, right? And, and this freed up the soldiers, right? It unshackled the soldiers and it had a radical effect on the performance of the German army, right? They became really flexible uh, uh, and agile. And the Israeli army, the Israeli army of the 1940s up until the 1970s, they also followed a similar approach. And military historians would say that those two armies, the Israeli Defense Forces and the German Army of the Second World War, were the most effective fighting forces of the 20th century. And the, 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 the roots of this approach that they took go back, it goes back to the, the Prussian Army of the 19th century. And there was a general there, uh, uh, who we'll talk about in a little while, who was basically, what he was trying to do is he was trying to implement Lean UX with his troops back in the 1860s and 70s. And this talk is about what we can learn from that long dead general who died about 120 years ago. So first, just a little bit of background and a little bit of history. What was Prussia and where was Prussia? So this is modern day Europe. That's modern day Germany. And Prussia, about the middle of the, the 19th century, was here, right? It changed a bit. It was very similar to uh, 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 the situation Israel finds itself in now. It was a small country whose borders changed a bit over the years, surrounded by much larger states that were often quite aggressive. Back in these days, before Germany was unified, it was made up of a lot of small states and duchies and grand duchies and little kingdoms and independent cities. And Prussia was the was the most dominant of all of those because it was good at waging war. Right? Waging war was really important in those days because the big powers like France and Spain and England and Russia, they used Central Europe as their battlefield. A lot of wars being waged over and back and over and back. And the Prussians managed to survive and to thrive because they were good at waging war. Right? Because of their military success. It was a military state and the military dominated the culture. And this is how they waged war back in those days. Right? So there was a general, this guy here, and he had command and control over the army. And he had a plan right, for the battle, and when events deviated from the plan, he would issue instructions as to what the soldiers should do next. So that's the general. There is instructions. He's giving the instructions to these guy, this guy here, who's going to go up to the front and tell these guys here what they should do next, right? But what often happened was that the general was way behind the lines, right? He was leading from the rear, right? With imperfect information. All the action and all the information is up here. And by the time this guy went up there, things would have changed again. And the orders he'd been given are kind of probably out of date, right? So it doesn't take a genius to work out that this wasn't the best way to wage a war. And the Prussian army, around the middle of that century, had become particularly rigid and centralized, right? Particularly obsessed with command and control, and particularly obsessed with long, detailed, elaborate plans. And this inflexibility led to a series of, series of military disasters, right? They lost a lot of their territory, and they lost a lot of their population. And this guy assumed command of the army, right, with a job to sort it out and to reform the army, right? Field Marshal Helmut von Malke the Elder, right? And he was, one of his pet peeves, one of the things that he hated most was the absurdity, as he saw it, of giving detailed instructions on the battlefields. You know, he felt that a much more flexible approach was required. And he spent the following 30 years trying to reform the army and change how they do things. And along the way, he had a couple of notable military victories, right? They defeated France, they de defeated Austria, and that led the way for the foundation, the unification of all the various German states into modern-day Germany. 
And Alf Craig's tactic played a central part in his reform. And you know, you could summarize Alf Craig tactics with these three points. Right? The first one is, is that missions are much more important than plans. Right? Plans are just how you do things. Right? And you know, it doesn't matter in war how you do something. Right? It doesn't matter how it gets done. What you achieve is much more important. So don't worry about how you do it, just get the job done. And then intent, intent is much more important than orders, right? Nothing could be more stupid than blindly following orders in the battlefield when the facts have changed and those orders are no longer relevant. It's much better to be spontaneous and use your own initiative as long as you're remaining true to the intent behind those orders. And the final point is trust and independence. In order to make this work, the generals had to trust that their soldiers would do the right thing on the battlefield. So they had to devolve power to an autonomy to their soldiers, which was quite a radical thing for an army to do. Lean UX has its origins with this man. Hands up anybody who's ever heard of this man? Steve Blank? Right, he's the kind of the godfather of the startup scene. And, you know, I'm sure anybody here who's got a startup has followed his blog or read his famous book, The Four Steps to, to, to the Epiphany. And one of his disciples, Eric, Eric Reese, wrote the book called The Lean Startup. And The Lean Startup spawned the movement of Lean UX and a whole pile of other books as well. And the premise behind The Lean Startup is that the classic approach that startups take to developing products Right, is full of risk and potential waste. Right? This is how it's often typically done. Startup would do some research and then it would spend some time designing, building, testing, and launching the product. And the whole thing might take 12 months. And the risk is, it's only here, once you release the product to your customers, that you find out if you built the right product or not. So you could spend 12 months building your product and then to find out that we built the wrong thing. And that's a really risky approach. And Steve said that there was two things that you could do to minimize the risk. Right? The first one is, is that it shouldn't be a linear approach, one step after the other, after the other. It should be an iterative approach instead. You do your research, you build the product, and then when you launch it to customers, you're in the perfect position right, to do more research. You've got real customers using a real product. It's a product so you can start the cycle all over again. It's called continuous deployment. And if you've got an app in the App Store or software as a service product, that's the world that you live in. And the second thing he said that could be done to improve this process is the process is don't take a year to do it. Don't take a year to go through the first cycle. Your goal is to get something in front of your customers as quickly as possible and learn from it and then iterate and try and make improvements and to keep on doing that until you get it right. And you might get through four iterations, for example, of mo or more in one year. And if you find out after three months that you've built the entire, you know, you've built the wrong thing completely, but well, that's too bad, right? But at least you've saved yourself nine more months of wasted effort. And if you find out after three months right, that you've kind of built the right thing, but it's not fully right, well, that's great. Now you're in a situation where you've got much more time and resources and energy to fix and improve things. Right? A lot of it is about minimizing risk. Right? In fact, the whole thing is about minimizing risk. I read an interview with the guy who wrote the Lean UX book, and he said the whole book is about minimizing risk, except that risk minimization didn't make for a very sexy book title. And I borrowed this example from uh, uh, the Intercon blog. Right? That just illustrates the riskiness and the, the less risky approach that you could take. Right? So let's just imagine that you were getting married right? and you were making your own wedding cake. And there was two approaches you could take to, to, take to, to building that cake. You could start off, right? approach one would be you could make a base, right? make the base and make the various layers of the cake. And then you could make the icing. Right? Put that in between the various layers, and then you could uh, or, sorry, make the filling, put that in between the various layers, and then you could make the icing. And on the morning of your wedding, the cake would be ready. 
But the risk would be that there'd be a lot of unknowns, right? You wouldn't know, for example, if the cake tasted well. You wouldn't know if the flavor of the icing and the flavor of the filling and the flavor of the base all work together well, for example, right? And you wouldn't be certain of the settings that you'd, you'd need to put into the, to the oven. How long should we cook it for? What would the temperature be? So you'd only know once you cut open the cake on the night of your big day if it worked or not. An alternative approach would be to do this. Start off by building a cupcake, right? And that would answer a lot of those unknown questions, right? Do the flavors work together, right? Do the filling and the base work or do they coagulate and make things messy? And then you could build a small cake and you could work out what settings you need to have in the, the oven, how long you put it in for, what the temperature, temperature should be. And then finally you could build your wedding cake. Both approaches get you to the same place at the same time, but the second approach is much less risky because you've got a lot of feedback and a lot more confidence along the way. And, you know, lean and agile are very similar. They go hand in hand. And agile development tries to minimize these risks as well. And if you're working in an agile environment, you could be doing multiple releases, not just a year, but multiple releases every month or every couple of months. And Lean UX was a reaction to this, right? The guys who wrote the book were trying to work out how do we fit our sometimes long-winded UX process into a two or three week design sprint? Because in the UX world, we would generally like to take our time. You know, a couple of months to do some research and think about it, a couple of months to do some design and think about it, and so on. How are we gonna fit that into a two or three week agile sprint, right? So something had to give and something had to change. And at the start of his book, Jeff got that kind of maps out principles behind Lean UX. And three of those principles are as follows, right? Working software is much more valuable than a big deliverable, right? You don't get any feedback from a big deliverable, but you do get lots of feedback from real software being used by real customers. The second thing he said is that collaboration is much more valuable than negotiation, right? So don't come up with a solution and then try and negotiate with your clients or your stakeholders and say, this is a great solution, right? And do some horse trading and haggling. Well, if you don't like this feature of the solution, then we've got to keep this one in, right? It's such a waste of effort. Why don't you actually collaborate with those customers, collaborate with those st stakeholders to come up with the solution in the first place? It's a much more effective approach. And the third thing he said was that responding to change is much more valuable than following plans. Right? Don't just slavishly follow the plan. Right? The plan in itself isn't valuable. It's what you're trying to get at the end of the plan that's really important. So as things change, you need to change with them. Keeping your eye on the ball far end. Okay. So that's a bit of background. And now we're going to go on to the five lessons. And the first one, which should be kind of obvious given what we've talked about, is that you should try and avoid long-term plans. Right? And that diagram in the background there was a long-term plan that I created for a client of mine a few years ago. And looking back on it now, I really wish I hadn't bothered. Right? So this is one of Steve Blank's most famous quotes. No plan survives first contact with the enemy. And what he's trying to say here is that you don't know What's going to happen when you put your products in front of your customers? Right, so there's no point creating a long, detailed plan that looks too far beyond that point. Right, because you don't know enough about your product or your customers are about, are about the market right, to create any detailed plans. Instead, what you should be trying to do is to get feedback from your customers as often as, and as early as possible. Right? And then with that feedback, you make improvements to your product you put it out to your customers again, you make more feedback, you make more improvements, and you iterate your way to success, right? Your goal is to find a product that fits a market, product market fit, it's called, right? And until you get that right, right, you don't have anything, right? But once you get it right, once you find that product market fit, then you can start making plans. But Steve actually stole that quote from our old friend, 
right? This is one of the most famous quotes in military history. No plan survives first contact with the enemy, right? So now you start to see that the connections between lean UX and outfrag tactics are, aren't entirely coincidental. I'm pretty sure Steve was reading a lot of military history as well. And what von Malke was trying to say was that war is way too unpredictable and way too fluid for long detailed plans to work, right? They usually become irrelevant as soon as you hit the battlefield. And what he said is a much better thing to do is to focus on the mission instead, right? Focus on the mission. This is what we're trying to achieve. You know, we want to take the hill at dawn, for example. And by all means, create a plan, but it's just a short plan. Right? To get your logistics in place, to mobilize the troops, and then to make sure that you're engaging the enemy in the best possible way. Right? But after this point, here, you have no idea what's going to happen. So don't plan beyond that point. Right? What you're hoping for is that your superior training and your decision making and your flexibility are going to win out. Right? So you're just going to improvise your way to success. And in Lean UX, in the Lean Startup is very similar proposition, right? Don't try and figure everything out in advance, right? It's not possible. You want to set an objective, set a mission, and then test the waters as quickly as possible. Come up with the first iteration of your product, put it out to your customers, right? You don't know what's going to happen after that point. And essentially what you're doing is you're iterating and you're improvising your way towards your mission, right? Trying to figure everything out in advance just doesn't really work. So the first lesson right, we can learn from von Malke is as, is, is, is as follows, right? If you see a long, detailed plan, right, you should question it, right? And if you're creating a long, detailed plan, you should question yourself, right? Much better to focus on smaller, more iterative plans instead. Second lesson is to define a mission, right? JFK famously said that he wanted to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, right? And that mobilized an entire country, right? Because it's simple and easy to understand, right? Missions have a clarity that plans don't, okay? If JFK in that famous speech was talking about the plan instead of the mission, he'd have been talking about things like this, right? Propulsion systems and gravity wells and hard landing systems and escape velocity and atmospheric re-entry techniques. Right? And nobody would be mobilized by that, because they'd all be bored stiff listening to it. Right? This, something about plans, not alone are they boring, but they're detailed and they're complicated and they're hard to remember. Right? Which is totally different to missions. Right? But so often, right, traditional armies ask their soldiers to memorize a detailed plan. And when the American army was invading North Africa in 1942, their field manual their plan was as big as the Sears robot, robot shopping catalog, right? And that's what the catalog looked like. Right? That's what these guys were trying to memorize as they were going into battle. The German army, <coughs> by comparison, and it's worth noting that when Germany was unified, right, the old Prussian army became the German army. And when they were invading France in 1940, one of the commanders of one of their armies, Kurt Zeitzler, these were the instructions that he gave to his guys. He said, gentlemen, I demand that your divisions completely cross the German borders, right? completely cross the Belgian borders, completely cross the River Meuse. I don't care how you do it. That's entirely up to you. And that was it. That was the entire plan that these guys had. Right? And it turned out to be a very successful campaign. They started on the 10th of May. Right? They arrived in Paris on the 14th of June, unopposed, right? and the French surrendered on the 22nd of June. Right? In six weeks, they completed their mission, and that was the sum total of their plan. So, some of the most successful startups have been successful because they focused on a mission, not because they followed a long, detailed plan. Right? So Dropbox right, is the poster boy of the, of the lean startup movement. Right? And they had a mission, make it incredibly easy to share, store, and sync files with 100% reliability. Spotify, hands up anybody here who uses Spotify? Like, 
Everybody, another really successful startup, right? They also had a mission, right? All the music in all the world on all devices, all the time. Right? When they were starting off Spotify, they didn't know that version 3.8.9.12 or whatever it is now was going to look exactly like it did now. But every iteration of Spotify right, is created with this mission in mind. Right? So they're iterating their way to success. So the lessons we can learn, right? the second lesson we can learn is that you need to define a mission. Right? And some of us aren't going to be working on grandiose projects to invade France, right? But it, so we wouldn't have missions like invade Belgium or cross the River Meuse, right? But a mission is just another term, right, for defining the problem that your product or the feature in your product is trying to solve. Right? And if your product isn't solving a problem, your feature isn't solving a problem, you really have to question whether it should exist, right? And your focus should be on achieving the mission, not following. A plan. Third lesson is about embracing chaos, right? So von Malke and the Prussians realize that there's two ways you can wage a war, right? You can try and tame the chaos, right, and corral it and control it, which is pointless, right? Or else you can try and exploit the chaos and use it to your advantage. And if you look at any successful German military com campaigns in the Second World War, they all kind of look similar, right? Everything was concentrated at one point to the, achieve the breakthrough, right? And then things spawned out from there. And if you look at the Israeli army, right? And their wars between the 1940s and the 1970s, it was a lot of similar things, right? These deep penetrations into enemy territory, right? And then they'd break things out from there. It's called Blitzkrieg, right? Although I'm pretty sure the Israelis didn't use that term, right? And that the, the, the the key term, or the key idea behind Blitzkrieg was the Schwerpunkt, right? The focal point. Concentrate all your energy and all your resources on one point, right? Preferably your enemy's point of weakness, and then you achieve a breakthrough. And when you make the breakthrough, you can make hay. Because at that point, you're behind the enemy lines. And there's nothing more chaotic in war than being behind the enemy lines. And the German army and the Israeli army were trained specifically to exploit that chaos, right? To improvise, to be spontaneous, and to be constantly moving forward. And in the Lean Startup, it's got a similar approach, right? You should be doing everything, everything possible, right? Concentrating all your resources to get product market fit, right? Because until you have product market fit, you've got nothing. But once you have product market fit, your goal, and all the opportunities present themselves to you. And in Lean UX, again, it's similar. You should be focusing all your efforts on solving the problem, on cracking the nut. And once you've solved the problem, everything else in your project is going to flow a lot smoother. And the chaos that I talked about, right, the chaos that's involved in making software is dealing with all these people. Right? Software is a really messy business. Right? Making software is really messy because it involves dealing with other humans. Right? And there's two ways you can, you, can, you can go about it. Right? You can try and convince them that your idea and your solution is right. right? Try and convince them to, to follow your plan, follow your idea. Or else you can actually work with them, right? actually work with them to solve the problem together. Right? It's called collaboration and it's a much more effective way of working. And this was us doing collaborative design inside and daft, right? It wasn't just a UX designer standing up in the room telling people this is my idea and isn't it brilliant and shouldn't you follow it? It was all the team, the designers, the developers, the marketers, the QA testers working together to figure out the problem, right? And it was a, it was, it was a great way of working, right? We talk, we sketch, we do it in a very structured way and we put the best ideas the best solutions and the best decisions up on the wall when we were done. Right? So all the decisions that we made, all the assumptions that we made, right? all the ideas that we had, uh, agreed on were up on the wall. And when we were finished doing our problem solving exercise, it would take about a week, we'd take that paper and we'd stick it up on the wall behind the developers. And we'd say, that's your spec. You know, this is what you're building, guys. Off you go. Right? But it, what was so effective about it was that there wasn't any handover to developers. 
because the developers were involved in solving the problem together, right? There was minimal handover after this point, minimal debate, minimal negotiation, because we've done it together, right, as a team. Uh, 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 and, you know, what we could focus on now, after we've solved the problem, was the serious business of actually building it as best we could, right? All the politics and all the nonsense was out of the way. So the, the, the third lesson that we can take from Von Malka, right, is take off your headphones, right? I know, you know, if you're a designer, one of the most enjoyable things about being a designer is you can put on your headphones and you can be working on whatever it is, right? And it's a really enjoyable thing to do, right? But sometimes you've got to take off your headphones and embrace the wider team, right? Harness the collective brain power. If you ask other people to help you solve the problem, you'd be surprised at the results that can come out of it. So number four is this idea that you need to be open to change, right? And flexible minded. So the, the US Army and the British Army, for example, they knew about outfire tactics for years, right? And they were always trying to emulate it, right? How can we do this as well? And they tried some of the techniques, they tried, tried some of the tools, but they could never get it right. Right, because it wasn't just about the techniques and the tools, it went a lot deeper than that. It was about philosophy. And those armies just couldn't get the, the core philosophy, which was, right, soldiers could disobey orders if the success of the mission depended on it. Right? And these old traditional armies, the US Army and the, U, the, the British Army, they just couldn't, they couldn't cope with that. Right? Because the whole structure of the military is founded on soldiers obeying orders. Right? A lot of what these armies do is they actually just train their soldiers, their foot soldiers, to be robots, just to do whatever they're told to do. And in hand with that, there's a lot of sacred cows in the military. Right? And one of them is, right, if the soldiers are robots, there has to be this kind of all-seeing, all-knowing general who could dictate events from afar. Right? And outright tactics did away with that concept. Right? They said there is no all-seeing, all-knowing gym. Right? Strategy is still important, right? but tactics have to be left to the soldiers who are at the coalface, right? who are on the ground. And one of the reasons that the Israeli army was able to implement outright tactics, as well, although again, they probably didn't use that word, is because they didn't have a 200 or 300 year old culture that they were fighting against. Right? They created their army from scratch in the 1940s. And a lot of that the founders of the army, like this guy, were self-taught. They were taking bits of military theory from the US Army, the British Army, and the German Army, and more often than not, right, they always felt that it was the German Army and the best ideas. Right? And the culture that we're trying to work against, right, it's not just the culture of your organization, it's the design culture, right? The UX culture. Right? Which has this kind of sacred cow as well, of the, uh, the, the sacred cow of the all-seeing, all-knowing, superhero UX designer, who's somehow smarter than everybody else in the team. Right? And somehow better at design and more knowledgeable than the you know, developers, and the business owners, the salespeople, are whoever. And when I was first doing collaborative design sessions, right, I was really kind of, I wanted to try it, but I was really worried. I was worried, like, what am I going to do? when these Android developers and iOS developers come up with these crappy designs. Like, what am I going to say to them? Right? One of the things I was genuinely worried about is like, how am I going to politely tell people that their designs are kind of crap? Right? I was, looking back, it was incredibly arrogant. Right? And as soon as we started working together, I realized that I was totally wrong. These guys know the medium, they know the technology so well that their ideas right, were much richer than anything I could, could have come up with on my own. And by working together with some of my design skills and a lot of their technical skills, we came up with ideas that none of us on our own would be able to produce. So the fourth lesson is, if you're a designer, right, that thinks, I don't know, that you have a monopoly on good ideas, right, you're wrong, right? You're living in an ivory tower and you need to get, climb down from that ivory tower. Sorry. You need to be a little bit humble Right? And you need to accept that you can learn a lot from other people. Right? You can learn a lot from about design from other people who aren't necessarily designers. So the final final lesson, the fifth lesson is this idea of giving teams autonomy. Right? So 
the German army and the Israeli army, what they would do is they would create these multi multidisciplinary teams. They'd have a sniper, and an artillery guy, a reconnaissance guy, put them into a unit and send them off. So you guys figure it out yourself, right? And it turned out to be a really, really effective way of working. And, you know, Lean UX, what we were doing in that room when I was at DAF, that was a multi multidisciplinary team, right? And if you're creating a multidisciplinary team, the worst thing you can do, right, is to come along after these guys have figured it out, right, and say, oh, I know you guys spent a week figuring this out, but I think you're wrong. I think you want to go with my idea instead, right? It's pointless putting the team together if they constantly get overruled by somebody coming in from the outside. Because I'm sure you all know how demoralizing it is if your boss or your boss's boss comes along and pokes his oar in on a project you're working on and tells you to change things without the same level of context and knowledge that you have, right? It's, it's, it's demoralizing, right? And the Prussians, the Germans, and the Israelis realize this, right? And they let those small units make the decisions on the ground, right? This guy, Napoleon, he realized it as well. He said, you must avoid countermanding orders, right? Because soldiers become discouraged and they lose confidence, right? And the Israelis knew it as well, right? They had a special word for it, which I won't even try and pronounce, but it basically meant at your own discretion, right? They encouraged their soldiers to make decisions on the ground. But if you do feel that your knowledge, right, and your skills and your creativity is indispensable to the success of the project, then you should get in there and lead from the front. Get involved in the workshops. Work with the team. Don't just be poking your nose in every now and then, right? When they did an analysis of the, 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 the Second World War, a lot of military historians would say that the, the US Army was quite timid and a little bit weak in comparison to the German Army. It was constantly a scenario where the captains and the lieutenants on the ground were getting overruled by more cautious generals in the rear. Right? And one of the things that the, the, the US Army wouldn't do or didn't do is that you used to have generals fighting in the battles. Right? Over the course of the whole Second World War, only 13 Army generals or US Army generals were killed in conflict. And two of those were actually executed by the Japanese. It wasn't a combat situation. In comparison, there was 220 German Army generals killed during battle. Right? These guys just get in and do the fighting with their soldiers. And it was the same in the Israeli army, right? That's General Diane. He didn't lose that eye playing football, right? And if you look, you might recognize this guy here, right? It's Ariel Sharon. He went on to become the uh, uh, prime minister. He was a general in that war as well. Fresh scars from the battlefield. These guys were mucking in and getting involved in the action, right? So the lesson here for us is, right? If you're creating these teams, you have to give them autonomy. Right? If you're in a position of authority, you have to give these guys autonomy and let them get on with it. Right? And if you're on one of those teams, you have to try and get autonomy. Right? Or else, if you're not going to give them autonomy, join in the fighting and lead from the front yourself. And what this all boils down to, really, is competitive advantage. At the start of the Lean UX book, Jeff Galtel talks about, right, if your competitors are working in a lean fashion, and they're constantly experimenting, and they're constantly releasing new versions of the product, getting feedback, and improving it, and releasing another version, that's a source of competitive advantage. And if you're not doing the same thing, you're losing out. Right? And when they did an analysis of, of soldier behavior in the Second World War, this American colonel, right, Trevor Dupay, he did an analysis of it, and he worked out the German soldiers were worth roughly 1.5 times a US soldier, right? So they inflicted casualties at a 50% higher rate than US soldiers did. And that was true no matter what the circumstances were, right? True when they were attacking or defending, true when they had a numerical advantage or disadvantage, right? True when they won and when they lost, right? And true when they had air superiority and when they didn't. And it wasn't because the German soldiers were stronger or braver or more warrior-like than the US soldiers. Right? It was just that they were working in a better system and they had better training. 
right? And that gave them that advantage. And Lean UX is a similar way of achieving that advantage in the software business. So just to conclude, right, that I suppose this presentation wasn't about the German army, but we talked about them a, a, a fair bit. And that's kind of an obvious question, I'm sure, hanging up there, right? If these guys were so good, if this army was so fantastic, right, why did they lose the war? Right? And the answer was because of this guy, right? So we all know that this guy was, was a nut, right? But he had a couple of things that were, that, were, that were going against him, right? One was that the arc of history tends towards civilization, right? The kind of barbaric, morally corrupt regimes like the Third Reich don't tend to last very long, okay? And these guys only lasted 12 years. They had a particularly short lifespan. But the second thing that was going against this guy was that in December 1941, he took direct control of the army, right? So he was no longer just a political leader, he became the military leader as well. And there's one thing that dictators like Hitler don't like, and that's independent thinking. Right? They don't want their soldiers to think independently. And over time, he rescinded alpha tactics. He rescinded the ability for German soldiers to disobey orders. And what he started to do over time was micromanage his way to military defeat. So that's it, guys. Thanks very much.